So the goal of this talk is basically for you to understand what ICAP is. Okay? And because ICAP is generalizable to many content domains, many instructional pedagogies and contexts and all grade levels, because it's so generalizable, if you could understand ICAP, then you could adapt and adopt and use it however you want. That's the goal of um, what I want to do. So I'm not going to give you specific um, recommendations for what you should do for specific classes or whatever. So it's just a generalized understanding. You'll see some people have adapted already. And some abbreviation in my talks will be S's for students, T's for instructors or teachers, K's for knowledge. And when I use the word instruction, it means either whatever the um, instructor says or tells us or the textbook or videos. So it in, includes all instructional materials. So as I said, ICAP is available to all three contexts of student learning, whether uh, the students are listening to a lecture, whether students are doing homework alone um, after school, or whether um, they're in a flipped classroom. So it's very generalizable to all these contexts. So this work has makes two fundamental assumptions that's quite different in approach from, I think, other work in the literature. And I'll just name those two assumptions right now so it's on the table. Uh, the most important one is that researchers, teachers, instructors, and students all think of teaching and learning uh, with the three components of instructors, materials, and students with the teachers at the center of focus, right? The instructor is the person who has the knowledge, the expertise. So research is always focused on the instructor's knowledge, the instructor's expertise, the pedagogical skills, and their instructional design activities, and the materials and assessment they create. That's always the focus, okay? What I wanna do instead is put students at the top of the focus. That's what we should focus on. And we have to understand how students learn and use that to dictate how we teach. Okay, that, so that's one focus. The other focus is the general constructive view of learning, which is, uh, has a very vague definition on the world, but I wanna give you a specific take now. So students typically come to instruction with various background knowledge, right? So here we have captured six, let's call it mental models of what students' ideas of the circulatory system is before they come to instruction. And because we want to be able to capture knowledge, we always work with uh, youngsters so that they don't have that much knowledge. So it's easy for us to capture, right? So anyway, so there's six models here and it goes from the left top to the um, lower right. And the most popular one, is this very single loop. There's no lungs in it. Just an example to, to talk about with you. So, there's, so the point to take is that students come to learning with a lot of variability in what they initially know. So what is assumption? An assumption, an instructor is explaining from his correct, perfect normative mental models, right? That's what he's explaining. Just as the text is explaining the perfect mental model. Uh, that's what's teaching is. But student in learning, they have to construct some understanding in the sense that they have to modify their mental model in a way that can assimilate instruction, right? So basically, in this case, for example, students cannot assimilate that information easily as her mental model doesn't have any lungs in it. So the sentence that says, in the lungs, carbon dioxide enters her blood and so on. It's just not comprehensible to the student at this point, right? So they have to do a lot of revision. And I'll bring that point up again later. So this talk has just uh, three parts. Here's the outline. I'm gonna talk very fast and briefly about the ICAP theory and just mention in one slide, the evidence, there's a lot of evidence. But most, of, most importantly, I wanna concentrate on the operational definitions because I think that's what people can use um, to design and, and their own activity and so on. Then I'm gonna give you several examples of actual applications of ICAP that I and others have used, have done. And then finally, I'll give you several caveats which are uh, constraints and conditions of the theory. Okay, the theory part. So, um, so consistent with the fact that teacher is the expert idea, lecturing or you know, teaching by telling has been predominant mode of teaching for over 900 years. And unfortunately, it still persists to this day. Basically, lecturing occurs in maybe 55% of STEM classrooms and 62, 65% of online classrooms. He says just a rough estimate. So 
the best evidence that students don't learn as well in a like in a lecture kind of context comes from the meta-analysis study that probably most of you already know. This is a study done by Freeman of where he did a meta-analysis of 225 studies. Um, comparing lecture classroom, lecture-based classroom, but non-lecture-based classroom, just those two comparisons, okay? So translating the effect size that he had, the learning outcome difference came to a difference of 0.47 effect size, which just roughly translates to, if you got 50% correct in lecture-based classroom, you get 68% correct for non-lecture-based classroom, okay? And the failure rate also changes. In a lecture-based classroom, there might be 34% uh, failure, but in non-lecture based, it's 22%. So his paper was very profound in giving us this kind of data. So um, I want you to note, I'll come back to it later, that this difference is based on combining a variety of non-lecture-based classroom, and I'll get back to this slide later. So why is active learning not widely implemented all over the place? Because Freeman's default definition that active learning is non-lecture-based isn't prescriptive, right? Uh, it, it, there's no clear-cut definitions of what instructors should be doing to make it active. There's no theory or predictions of what, so that instructors don't know when they do something wrong, what, what can substitute one thing to another? They, can, they don't know that because there's no definition. Um, so currently, most active learning is simply implemented as learning groups, small groups typically. But we'll show you that working in groups or pair is only effective under certain conditions. It's not always effective. So there's limitations to that. You have to define it carefully. But if the focus is on how students learn, what's the problem? The problem is that how learning is a cognitive activity. It requires a lot of thinking. And thinking happens in the head. So it's covert, you can't really see and it's opaque when students are thinking, especially in a class, you don't know whether they're thinking or not thinking what they're thinking, right? However, the key assumption that I can make is that it turns out that students overt behaviors uh, in terms of how they interact with instruction or instructional materials and the visible products that they produce might indicate how engaged they are, okay? So, so that's the big assumption, operational assumption. In fact, it seems quite easy to discriminate four distinct ways that students engage with instruction. And I, I label these four ways as ICAP for interactive, constructive, active, and passive. Um, so these are these words are capitalized. So it means it means specific ICAP mode, not the general idea, active learning or passive classrooms. So the next few slides, what I'm going to do is um, go through the definition of what these four modes are that we can uh, see actively in a classroom. So the first mode is uh, passive mode. It simply describes the behavior of students paying attention, such as listening to a lecture, uh, listening to feedback, or watching a video. And they produce basically no uh, no outputs, okay, they produce nothing. Um, so that, that's called passive. And notice in most lecture classroom, this is what they expect and prefer the students do, that they pay attention. The next uh, mode is active, which describes the behavior of manipulating instructional materials and such as underlining or highlighting your textbook or copying something on the laptop, okay? That's manipulating the material. And the key thing about manipulating material is that the students produce no uh, produce outputs, which are the highlighted sentence, but they don't contain any information beyond what was already presented. That's a key, key difference. So manipulating means you simply do something with the material, but the material is already there. So you highlight it, you underline it, you copy it. Those are all manipulating, okay? so. In, the, in contrast, the third level is constructive, describes the behavior of generating some knowledge. And then generating some, like, like you can draw a concept map or you can uh, draw a little diagram or anything like that, or take notes in your own words. And so the key difference between this and active is that the material you produce is not information that was already given, it's beyond the information that was already given, right? Suppose you post a question, or well, the question wasn't already there, so you produce a new piece of information. So anything you produce, it could be a min minuscule little thing, 
uh, or something as big as a concept map are things that you've produced and you've been generated. So that's a constructive mode. And then the interactive mode describes the behavior of two peers collaborating uh, in, in a way such that each peer's output generates beyond what they already said or what the material already shown. So each peer is constructive. In addition, each peer must be generative above what their partner mentioned. So it's sort of double beyond yourself and beyond text and beyond the, the partner. Okay, that's the definition of um, interactive for ICAP. Okay, so the other thing to notice is that uh, the four ICAP modes all refer to on-task behaviors, on-task engagement behaviors, not off-task behaviors. So listening to lectures, copying, drawing, they're so all on-task behavior, okay? Off-task behaviors, on the other hand, such as sleeping, uh, looking at uh, your cell phone and so on, those, those behaviors have been detected, there have been methods to detect these for example, Ryan Baker is very well known for doing this kind of stuff. They use learning analytics to detect it. Or if you just, if you just look at for online course, how often a student opens you know, the homework assignments or whatever, any indicators like that are indicators of online behavior on or offline, not engagement behavior. Okay, that's an important distinction. So we're only talking about on-task behavior. So this is just a summary cheat sheet sheet of the four modes. It's very easy, very easy to operational definition. You are, when you're passive, you're paying attention, but you have no output. In the next one, you're manipulating materials. Your output is uh, part of the input, inputs, let's say. For constructive, you're generating something new that wasn't in the materials that you got. And finally, interactive, you reciprocally co-generative with your partner. So very simple four definitions. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, see if you got my definition. So here's an active, is this an active mode? So you're measuring a solution in a, in a lab course, right? And you're measuring solution and um, the different color um, liquids that you combine generated a new color. So after you combine, you saw that now it's green rather than uh, yellow. So is this lab test in the constructive mode? How many people say yes? How, how many people say no? <laughs> right, it's, 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 a, it's not in the generative mode, it's in the active mode because you didn't, you didn't generate the new color, the, the material generated new color, right? So that's, that's the distinction. Okay, another question. When students are receiving feedback, which ICAP mode are they engaged in? I actually gave this answer away earlier. <laughs> Who says active? Who says constructive? Okay, it's the answer is um, it's, a, it's uh, passive, right? They're just receiving feedback. So they're just paying attention. That's what they're doing. So feedback isn't as great as you think it is if students are only passive, right? So that's, that's the idea I want to get across. So people always think fee feedback is so great. Okay, question. This is actually a study that was done in the 70s, and I, I was very puzzled by the results, and everybody was very puzzled by the results at the time, and now we can explain it. So the study show, I'm, you know, just maybe somebody replicated, but definitively that for peers interacting, the one who gave explanation learned a lot more than the one who received the explanation. And this was a big puzzle back then. And, and it's the same answer. That is, the person who receives their explanation could be passive, but the person who gives the explanation is generative. So it's not, all, it's not clear that receiving um, feedback is that always great. Okay, now the ICAP hypothesis. So basically, the ICAP hypothesis states that uh, learning decreases from I to C to A to P. And... Um, and I can't go back and ex explain to you how I came up with the subsuming nature. The subsuming nature of the hypothesis came from the behaviors, which is subsuming, as well as the corresponding thinking processes underlying each mode, but I can't, uh, don't have time to explain it now. But what's important to notice is that there's two greater signs between the C and the A. So I and C is much, much better 
than uh, A and P. Just to tell you now is that the upper two, I and C can uh, help you get deeper learning, whereas the lower uh, two modes only gain uh, shallow learning. Okay, so this is the only data slide I'm gonna show you. It turns out the ICAP hypothesis make many, many predictions, right? The pairwise prediction and using transitive inference, you can say C is better than A, C is better than P, I is better than A, I is better than C. So there's just lots of uh, conditions that you can. It turns out if you look at the educational literature or at psychology literature, there's just hundreds of studies that have these pairwise comparisons. They compare one thing with another, like, and like example on the bottom, number one, they compare students who correct the concept map and then compare it with some students who just read a concept map, right? And then they show, oh, correcting concept map is great. And then another study comes along show that uh, if you study an incomplete example um, versus studying a complete example, studying incomplete example is better. Oh, great. So there's lots and lots of studies like that. And there's no consistent explanation across all these studies. And now ICAP can explain them all. So not only can ICAP explain why correcting concept map is better than reading, but that's constructive versus passive, or why studying incomplete is better than studying complete, same thing. Not only can I now explain all these data, but we can explain data that seems either conflicting or whatever with the same thing. For example, if you uh, ask students to correct a concept map and you compare it to reading a concept map, one is better than the other, but if you co correcting concept map versus two people working on the concept map, then it's worse than two people working concept map. So people cannot explain all these results other than just what it is. Oh, doing concept map together is better. Now we can lay a general interpretation on all these studies. So there's lots of studies like that. So I already explained why, okay? Now that's the end of the part one theory part that has the definitions and the evidence so do you have any clarification questions that you wanna ask now before I go to part two? Uh, quick question, how do these relate to the Bloom taxonomy levels? Seems like as you go up towards the, the topmost, the C part, sort of the interactive part, you're going higher and higher on the Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, I'll, I'll, I knew somebody yeah, was gonna yeah. ask me about the Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> um, well, I can just answer that very quickly now is, Number one, the three fundamental differences between ICAP and Bloom's taxonomy. One is that Bloom's taxonomy is really about assessment. And we have some assessment too, but his is mostly about that. Um, secondly, Bloom has six categories of thinking, and I went over his six categories. And um, I can, um, basically, I only have two categories, really active or constructive that he has. These are all active or constructive. And... And they're um, all mixed in. Every, every category that he has has active and constructive in there. But the most important difference between what I'm doing and what Bloom did is that um, he's about assessment and he has six categories. Oh, I know. The main thing is he's assuming that students are doing X, Y, Z. For example, he says uh, for the analysis level, students are really separating the whole into components and thinking that way. We can't tell what students are thinking. And the particular question doesn't entail that those are definitely the processes that's gonna happen. So he's just guessing what students might be doing in all these cases. Whereas I'm just combining into two categories with overt explicit products or not, or no products, you know, distinction, whether they're from in a much clearer dissection into two categories. So his is all active and constructive. I, I, uh, very interesting so far. Um, and so, you know, you kind of classify delivering lectures or watching online videos as, you know, passive, passive. Um, but I think a lot of us have the expectation that the students are not just simply watching the videos, but they're also taking notes. Um, and so where does that kind of fall into kind of the, the framework you're presenting? Well, that's it, that if they are taking notes, there's two comments, but if they are taking notes, um, if they're taking notes that are just, they're copying, often students copy what's shown on the, on the slides. If they're just copying, then they're just being active. They're listening and taking notes. But if they take the notes in their own words, that then they're listening and uh, being generative. So they're in the constructive mode. So they can do something else besides listening, right? 
And I, th I thought you were also going to ask me about that. If uh, it's possible, it's definitely possible because this is all probabilistic thing. It's possible that you're sitting there just listening, but you're really thinking deeply. And this is particularly possible if your mental model is a little bit close to mine, because then everything I say, you can just assimilate, right? So you can actually be active only if you knew a lot about this material. So the six mental models I mentioned, if yours was toward the end, the sixth one, then that comment that the teacher mentioned about carbon dioxide and everything is easily assimilated. So it does, but this gets complicated. It does matter how much you know. The more you know of what I know, the easier it is for you to assimilate. I wasn't gonna go there, but that, that's the question, but that is a comment that's relevant. Thank you very much. Okay. The next part is going to be on applications of ICAP. And I think there's a lot more applications out there. I know there's a couple of theses coming out of ASU that I didn't direct, um, but I didn't get a chance to look at it yet. But I'll tell you about the ones I know. OK, we're going to talk about six types of application and six examples. And all these applications, you just have to keep thinking about what's the students asked to do? What's the student asked to do? Don't think about what the faculty is doing, what the student. What, so that, that's how you think about how these things work. Uh, three of these six types were actually undertaken by actually faculty or students and teachers without any training, without any guidance from me. So this is what I mean. If you understood it, you can design your own activities and ask your own questions and so on. And let's run through this example. So we're gonna look at design activities, assess online courses, Avoid misadoption, evaluate, evaluate tools, phrase question, and modify lectures in minuscule ways at the, at the end. Okay, how to design activities. Now this is gonna, you're gonna think this is similar to Bloom, but it's really not. So how do you design activities ideally to elicit constructive activities? So it turns out that activities for students typically are written with directives, right? The directives means an explanation, such as summarize the reason given in this text or justify each solution step. That's, what, that's your homework for the, today. That's what you gotta do. And these directives do contain verbs. So we found that verbs can be easily classified into ICAP modes. So, uh, so for example, summarize, which mode is that? Well, if they're just summarized by delete, um, there's a way to summarize where you just copy and delete some sentences, that's active. But if you summarize in your own words, that would be constructive. And justify, which mode is this? Well, you're provi by providing justification, so that, that would be constructive, okay? So, these, so that's how you can summarize these verbs. And um, so we went through the protocols that the teachers generated, and we saw that all these verbs could be classified so things like what would be passive would be the teacher would say, listen to me, I look at the board, go through this and review. It's active if the teacher says, describe the best options, sort these uh, nouns and verbs, follow the example or match similar uh, solutions. Constructive if you say, explain why, make up your own reason, imagine and draw, justify. And um, it, collaborative might be exchange ideas with your peers, debate, answer your peers' question and expand your own, uh, your peers' reason, expand your peers' reason, okay? So these are verbs, so it seems like very easy to classify verbs into different categories. And these numbers in the parenthesis, 6, 58, 28, 9, are the actual number, the frequency of number of verbs that our teacher sample, this is K-12 teachers actually use. Okay, so which ICAP mode do you think these ver verbs are? Choose, select, recall, measure, highlight, underline, copy, identify, list, order. Are they active or constructive? How many people says active? Okay, they're all active. <laughs> okay, good. Now, what about explain, justify, defend, predict, draw, come up with, compare, contrast, integrate, support? These are obviously all constructive verbs. So, to our surprise, we could classify these verbs easily. There's just, even without, without knowing the exact context, of course, the context helps define it even better, right? So I want you to note that 
eight years or 10 years ago, somebody gave me a bunch of questions that instructors asked and asked me to classify them. And I couldn't because I didn't think about ICAT back then. And I said, I can't, I can't classify them unless I know what this instructor was teaching. So now we think we can. So that's it. Even though, so I came up, I just sat there and came up and I looked at stuff, materials I had. I came up with 68 manipulative verbs and I said, label the triangle, measure out and 58 constructive verbs. Now, a lot of these verbs I took from actual studies of strategies that people have used, right? They study how do you um, do modeling and so on compared to some contrast. So these words were picked up from actual studies. So that's just example. Okay, so it seems trivial to change the verbs, right? So I'm gonna give you three authentic example of upgrading in uh, two ASU college classes and one K-12 classes. Now, these upgrades were done by these faculty without me thinking about the verbs at the time. And we didn't tell them what to do. They just did it after they understood ICAP. So first example comes from uh, Steve Krause. He's a professor in engineering. And he and I actually worked on ICAP a little bit back then. And he had a task. So he understood ICAP really well. And he had a task uh, where students simply picked pick one of these choices and fill it in, okay? And then, so it's a selection class. You just choose one of the answers, right? So after learning about ICAP, he changed it to uh, a generative task. You see, he asked the students the same materials uh, to explain and draw. So they have to explain um, what these properties of changes are and what are the unit cell transformation. So it turns out that was a change in the verbs, right? Okay, here's another example by a geology professor, Sampton, uh, here. And um, he orig originally had his task on the left, 2018, where he asked people to match the rock type to the sedimentary to some uh, the environment. After learning about ICAP, he changed it to identify, predict, interpret. So again, I didn't tell him how to change it. Steve changed it, changed it himself. Third example comes from K-12 middle school teacher when we ask them to upgrade the activities uh, however they want. So for example, so this teacher upgraded this fraction problem from fill in each section with a group of equivalents. So, you, so that's, you fill it in 0.8, you choose one of these down below and put it up there. This is a very common uh, kind of, um, format the K-12 teacher choose. So that's, that's really just a selection class. I saw you pick one and put it in there. So that's active. Instead, he changed, she changed it to a constructive task that is generate an equivalent representation so you weren't given any choices. So again, this teacher also changed all these things just from understanding ICAP without any help. So um, that was the verb. Now we're gonna go look at a second uh, application, which is to use ICAP to assess the doses, dosage of different modes of uh, learning in six online classes at ASU. So these were six chemistry classes, online classes. It was done by a PhD student, Jesse Ha. And what he did was he, evaluate, he developed a rubric to evaluate the, uh, the design of these lessons or yeah, these kind of, the whole course actually he evaluated the whole course by six chemistry professors. So he analyzed the activities within each of these classes and assigned an ICAP mode and assigned the number of minutes each mode was devoted to, um, number, devoted to each mode. So for example, lecturing is passive, you know, how many minutes per class was devoted to lecture. Exercise is the choosing multiple choice answer that's active, how many minutes, how many minutes in lab, lab assignments and what parts of it was active and constructive. Anyway, so he did the best to assign the mode and the number of minutes. So well, now we're gonna show you what he found that is the number of minutes of each kind in, in these online classes. So the first two is passive and active. So 27 hours and 42 hours were devoted to active and passive. Four hours and six hours were devoted to constructive interactive. This is online class. So the first two is obviously shallow learning. So you're devoting most of your time to shallow learning. So my point is, so the goal of our improvement and upgrading 
it's not to upgrade all activities to constructive interactive, you know, that's not necessary. And we'll explain why it's not necessary later. But we need to be less skewed than this. The skew is just way, seven one difference is just way too much, right? So we can't do critical thinking, deep thinking this way. Okay. Now I'm gonna to return to the Freeman study that I said I would return to. So if you think about the Freeman study, he was comparing lecture base with non-lecture base. The, the lecture base uh, classroom were, um, probably were mostly active classroom, weren't constructive. So the 68% would be much greater if it was uh, simply if we really were comparing passive with constructive, right? So mostly he was comparing passive with mostly active. So I'm just saying that difference would be even bigger. Okay, application three, how we can, how understanding ICAP can prevent adverse changes to how we adopt tools and, and um, different kinds of tools. So let's use clickers examples. That's a very popular device to use in classroom. So there's three parts to clicker, think. So the first one is think um, down below. You get a question, you think of an answer and choose to respond. Second one is pair, that is you talk to us, um, um, appear to sort of resolve your differences in your son and then you share again. So this is how it should be used and this is how this physics professor at Harvard initially thought of it. However, uh, most of the time, a faculty use it as an assessment tool. That is, they don't do the interaction part. They don't share. They just give them a question, ask them, assess and look at it. So they just do number one. So they, when they only do number one, what did they reduce the task to? So the task initially had interactive as well, like collaborative. So now, just by doing this, they reduce the task to which mode? Active? Active, because you're just choosing a response. So from a wonderful collaborative task, interactive, you reduce it down to just uh, active task. So, so if you understood ICAP, then you would say, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe the, so the advantage of this task is not just to think and choose, the advantage is the collaborative part, but they didn't know that, right? And I, I'm, uh, so that's how it gets changed. Okay, the fourth application, you can use ICAP to evaluate technology tools to decide whether you want to adopt it. So back in, I think it was 2007, AOC was thinking about using um, Echo 360. So I went and looked at Echo 360 back then and sort of cataloged and um, wrote down all the, all the actions that the student had to take. So it turns out most of the actions were of this type. You use the play bar to pause, play, rewind. You can bookmark a location. You can flag some content that you need to go back to, take notes that repeat the content, respond to multiple choice question, respond to image question, thumbs up to other questions and responses. So these were a lot of the actions, but what kind of response, what kind of mode was, is the, are these responses? Active, right? So it, when you evaluate a tool, you wanna ask yourself, is this really gonna get deeper learning if we adopt this tool? And you can look at uh, various other tools as well using ICAP. Okay, application five. Um, how to phrase question to elicit either active or constructive responses. Um, and the verbs does come into play, but it doesn't have to. And not only the verbs doesn't have to come into play, but typically in the literature, people like to say, you need to use the W questions, who, what, when, what, where. But that doesn't make uh, a difference either. I mean, you really have to look at what you're asking for from the student's perspective. So. These are questions that, were come, that came out from two K-12 teachers that we taught ICAP to, but we didn't tell them how to generate questions, but they generated these. So active question would be things like, describe what we talked about yesterday. Uh, can you tell whatever is shown? Tell me the number, whatever is shown. So these are just active questions. Um, generative question would be things like, uh, look at what is being generated. What will happen to the mice to have mutation described in the text, asking for prediction? Um, why do you think so, asking for explanation? What evidence do you have to support it, ask for justification? What do you think, what do you need to find out in order to solve this problem? 
planning and how, how does this concept relate to what we learned yesterday, connection. So these things, prediction, explanation, plan, connection are not, are not something that you already presented. So this is how you should phrase the question. Not, not what, whether the question has a what question or why question. It's really asking, you gotta look at what the content of what you're asking. Anyway, so this application to questions was, so um, application six is something I just did quickly, easily. So people think that um, what I'm proposing is that you should give up lectures. No, I don't think you should give up lectures. I mean, doesn't matter what I say, faculty's not gonna give up their lectures, okay? They love their lectures. And so you can save your wonderful lectures just by tweaking it ever so little bit with one minute insertions or two minute insertion. And we'll go back to why in a minute. So all I did was pick out strategies, there's thousands of them online, on the web, there's lots and lots of strategies. It's just that now with ICAP, you know which ones are better than which other ones, right? So I can again, just go, so I just picked out five. Um, you can pause for two minutes, ask students to reflect, discuss, write the mightiest point. So there's lots of uh, papers now published about how asking students to generate the mightiest point is really great. Well, yeah, you ask them to be generative, right? Uh, pause and insert a question, or ask students to provide support for a statement uh, that you made, provide solution on the blackboard. These are all, these all have some uh, data. Provide solution to blackboard that has an error in it and ask students to find the error. Ask students to generate test questions and ask them to draw visual. I mean, there's tons of idea that you can adopt. And these only take a minute or two just to insert a pause um, in the lecture. So let me just go back and explain why you need to insert a pause. And I think we already got that idea. Frequent pauses and lectures are necessary. In fact, the best break is every, every seven minutes, you should take a pause. Uh, the reason pauses are necessary because uh, lecture provide input at a very fast pace. Every sentence that comes at you could be new information. So just look at this. This, um, oh, there's something wrong with that I didn't catch before, but this student has a naive mental model without, it doesn't have lungs in it. And so the thing is talking about in the lungs. So already the students said, uh oh, in the lungs, my circle of trust doesn't have the lungs. And after that first sentence, the second sentence talked about oxygenation. So, uh-oh, what do I do with that? So it takes students a long time to construct and revise the representation, depending on how, how naive it is initially. So that takes pauses. Okay, that's the end of applications. Good timing here. Um, any questions about applications? Okay, let me go back. Go to caveats, because I think uh, the caveats going to relate to some of your questions. The third part is caveats, some condition constraints and cautions, especially, especially by interaction, which is important to point out. So um, there's three caveats here. So if the goal of instruction, yes. Yep. How does this impact grading, thinking about large classes? So that's one of the caveats. So my comment to that is that you don't always have to give, you don't always have to give uh, feedback as in a grade. So in a, in a lecture, you can ask students to do something. You don't always have to grade it. The, they benefit from doing it. And, but if, you, you have, if, if they insist on having feedback, maybe there's other uh, ways like you can ask them to show it to a peer or something. But the benefit is the fact that they do it. It's not so much whether they got the feedback, okay. So if the goal of this instruction is to achieve deeper learning, then you want ICAP. If you only want uh, uh, shallow learning, like memorize all the terms of, uh, of, the, terms of um, the body parts, then you don't need uh, to be constructive. Active is good enough. Okay, that's one point. The second point is that not all domains uh, require deep learning, right? So for example, uh, grammar. Do, to learn grammar, uh, Ruth Wiley actually dissertation work on grammar and self-explaining didn't work because grammar, the rules of grammar, you can't elaborate. There's no rationale for why they add S now and you don't add S now. So you just have to memorize that. So for domains that you just have to memorize, active is good enough, okay? The third thing that's very important is that despite what you say, what you tell students to do, they're not gonna comply, right? So in our data, Students would did not 
clearly not 100% students comply. If you ask them to be generative, they might be generative 30%, maybe 30% of them would do that. Nevertheless, it's still better for you to ask them a generative task or question than for you to ask active because that 30% of students who did do it is gonna bring the grades up for the class, right? So it still it doesn't matter how many percent did it, it's still better than nothing. So it's still good to do that. Now, this is the most complicated. I have to explain why the interactive mode uh, is better, sometimes better than constructive actually, but not always. And, but interactive and constructive are much better than A and P. So it's very important to understand that the interactive mode is not always better than constructive. And I'll explain it now. So what is, so when is interactive collaboration really helpful? It's when the partners co-construct. So what does co-construct mean? So in the literature, it's very vague, very broad. Co-construction is a distinctive approach with emphasis on collaborative working, partners working, approach includes some interactional processes such as cooperation, coordination. So there's no definitive answer. But in ICAP, we have a definitive answer. A definition. So co-constructing, as I alluded to earlier, is when each partner generates beyond instructional material and beyond the partner's contribution, right? So if the and if partner says something, I build on it basically. However, uh, th this is, so the two, I didn't catch this, the two sign means interacting. Equal signs means they work in parallel. Equal means they work in parallel. So the first, under the first dyad, uh, two people can co-construct. That means they each construct and they interact and they're constructing on, on the other person. But two person can also each be constructive and work in parallel and they're not interacting. So when they're not interacting, that's just equal sign. So viewed that way from each person, there's you know, many options how two people can interact. They could, uh, one person could be passive, the other active, can, two people are active, can active and constructive. When you have active constructive, that you usually means that one person dominates. And so there's many patterns that people can interact, but only the top one for sure is better than a single person constructive. And maybe the second one where two people are constructive pair might be better than a single person constructive. So basically at best, only 20% roughly, I forgot how I got the estimate, 20% of the time to collaborate to actually learn more than just being constructive, only 20%. So you can't expect it to uh, always, and the data shows that. The data shows that maybe only 20% of the time uh, collaboration is better than no uh, working alone. Okay, uh, so I wanna give you um, two examples of actual collaborative dialogue we just collected from ASU students in biology classes. Um, these students were not trained on how to collaborate, just to show you that it happens and it does. So here's the question they were asked to solve. So this is for a different project they were worked on, but we collected these data. So on the island of mountain goats, the population sheet was 560 feet in 2019 and so on. But in later years, the population has increased and so on. So what kind of growth model is probably most useful for the population? That was the question. So in the next two slides, I'm gonna show you authentic dialogues uh, with students, no training, no training on how to collaborate. We can code each term uh, for ICAP mode, right? Just like I show, this was a student active constructor. And then we can give an overall score. Uh, I mean, it's whatever. However, I just did it very quickly here, just to show an example. Okay, here's the dialogue. I think this is a good co-constructive dialogue. So um, the first student, DC7, says his like is logistic, just making a choice. So that's active. The second student said, it doesn't go all the way. It comes back down, right? So I think it's logistic. So he, he's providing justification, intentional degrees, but then he's constructive beyond the partner's contribution. I think um, describing it. And then the student says, the first student said, yeah, it seems like a logistic a thing is though, but the logistic doesn't da da da. So what he's doing is the student's providing the boundary condition. So he's constructive beyond the student. And then DC4 says, yeah, the value of top Y would be six, 
6.30, he's stating the value of the boundary condition. And then he's also constructed because he's following up the student's line of reason, his partner's line of reasoning. And then uh, this last student, I mean, the student DC7 again says, um, but it increases, or still logistic growth, right? but it kind of decreases from it. So he's elaborating beyond the con uh, boundary condition. So he's also constructive. So you can say that this little snippet of collaboration is pretty co-constructive for two students. Now look at this next one. I would say this next one is just not very co-constructive at all. So the first student, again, suggested response for via choice. But the second student, uh, Put it, I said, I, he puts it in the Excel sheet and let the Excel thing make a projection and just try to illustrate it on the screen, right? He's not adding anything, he's just illustrating. And the student DC8 says, because the only thing they talk about was logistics, just a meta comment. And then DC882 says, well, it's not linear, just rejects a choice, gave no reason. And DC78 said, no, just passive, sort of. DC82 says, it's not exponential, again, just ruling out. I don't think it's logistic because logistic goes, it's a log function, just recalling some information about logistic. And then DC78 says, yeah, just agree. And, and then DC82 just described the pattern on the screen. Again, it's going up and going down. So again, I just randomly take these uh, dialogues and clearly this, these two people are not very co-constructive. So we would predict, although, we don't, we can't, we haven't coded it. But these students will not learn as well as the other two students, prior students. But so, so this shows you the definition of co-constructing and that it does happen. So, so why is co-constructing better than each partner being constructive? Or why is co yeah, why is co-constructing good? There's two, the prevailing view in the literature is that it's complementary knowledge. The two people typically would come with different knowledge. That's the first thing on the left. That is one person knows this, one person knows that. And together, of course, if you don't have the knowledge, you can't do it. So complementary knowledge clearly works. But my point is that it's the interaction process, processes. That is, instead of the complementary knowledge view, I have the interaction view, which is that even if they come with identical knowledge, by interacting, collaborating, they could learn a lot more. And let me show you, show you uh, what I mean. So that's because human beings are really good, if they want to, make inferences, general ideas, general relations, they can generate connections. That's what we're really good at doing, okay? So basically what we're doing then is uh, for the interaction view, each person, each person, like the man, can say something, let's say he infer X, and then the woman said, can encode, assimilate the X, and link it, connect it to something she already knows, Y, and infer Z. So the point is that when you interact, even though you have the same knowledge, you can make different inferences from what knowledge you already have. And then um, you are generating something, ultimately, the Z that X didn't, that man never thought about generating. So you could create something new. So by co-constructing, you could create something novel that neither of you could have created alone. That's how powerful I think interaction processes are, but it's difficult to get. So, so the interaction view means we should really design training and how to help people collaborate in this co-constructive way. And to this day, I'm not aware of any training system yet. Okay, this is, um, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time and I wanna see if I can get across to you um, what I mean. So caveat five, so if you pick up a book um, on how to help people learn, how students learn out there, there's tons of them. And basically the way they want to sell their book is to say that they're, they're applying and translating very robust education, education psychology findings or psychology findings, okay? So uh, what do I mean by that? So they're applying robust, a very robust set of evidence-based finding from decades of research. All these books that we have decades of research um, and we should do this in a classroom. So some examples are um, you should space learning. So you should space learning over time, you know, present some material, present it again later and so on. 
or you could take out extraneous material because you have low workload limitations, so you shouldn't have workload. So there's tons of those kind of very robust sound studies, and we can translate them to instruction, obviously. That's not what ICAP's doing. And how is ICAP different? So the major difference between ICAP and those kind of study, I claim is that, oh, let me give you a more example. So I said limitation, how to overcome that. And so basically those kind of studies look at um, fundamentals of the human mind. What can the human mind do? And what are the human mind's limitations, right? So we have short-term memory limitations. And we also have capabilities, like we can, um, we, we're much better in coding if you show me something visually and orally or, or verbally, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you verbal information and showing you visual information. That's really helpful for you, right? You're very good at taking in two kinds of information like that helps you understand. So we have capabilities you can take advantage of and we have limitations that we can work around. Okay, so a lot of majority studies are like that. However, the difference from ICAP, what ICAP tries to do that they're not doing is that they're not addressing problems of learning, real learning in school. So for example, what are the problems of real learning in school? Students have shallow understanding versus deep. Students can't transfer their knowledge to another context. They can't carry out, they can carry out procedural skills, but they don't really understand them. They have inaccurate cell monitoring skills. They have very serious misconceptions that we can't seem to address or eliminate. Um, and teachers cannot assess to uh, understanding uh, in real, real time very easily, right? So there's a lot of problems in learning, authentic learning that are not addressed by the limitations of human mind or the capabilities of human mind, okay? So that's how they're different. Okay.